I think it's very important, I always used to say this, but I don't have an academic background. I haven't done any research on this subject. I'm just a simple cop. And I'm not even an investigator. I work out in the field. I work in the streets, in the apartment, and in the hotels where there is prostitution. And my job is simply to arrest as many buyers of sexual services as possible. Let me see if my presentation is running. Great. Uh, <laughs> Uh, first, I just want to mention our law. You all know about this one, so I will just mention it very, very briefly. It is illegal to buy sex, it is illegal to try buying sex, and it is illegal to help someone else buying sex. Uh, this is what we think is our best tool in fighting human trafficking. Uh, but I really think it's important for you to understand the background to the law. The State Secretary already mentioned a little bit about it, but uh, uh, I used to speak about three different perspectives. Uh, and it's important that you understand this, because when we go out as police officers working, this is what we have in our minds. This is uh, the background to, to why we do what we are doing. And the first perspective is equality that it is not acceptable uh, in a modern society that women and children can be bought and sold. It is not acceptable that a man on his way home from work is paying 150 euro to do whatever he pleases with a woman. That is not equality, my friends. The second perspective being the victim perspective. This is actually a quote from the uh, Swedish government proposition that preceded the law back in the 90s. Uh, and he says that it is unreasonable to also criminalize the one who, at least in most cases, is the weaker part who is exploited by others who wants to satisfy their own sexual desires. I want to say something. In Sweden, we have, a, as I think in many other countries represented here today, we have a strong pro-prostitution lobby. And it is really important uh, for you to understand that, as you know, this pro-prostitution lobby claims that they are selling sex out of their free will uh, because it's a part of their sexuality and because they see it as a normal job. But it's important for you to understand that, this, that the sex purchase law wasn't meant for that. The sex purchase law uh, was meant to work as a wall against organized crime and human traffickers to prevent them from establishing themselves in Sweden. But the problem in this debate, as I see it, is that we have a very few individuals from the pro-prostitution lobby, who has a very strong voice in the public debate. Uh, the big problem is that the absolute majority of women that I meet, who come from Nigeria, from Romania, and Bulgaria, and so on, they don't have a voice in the public debate. They are not sitting in the TV studios, they are not being interviewed by the newspapers, and that's why, why we as Swedish police, we try to be a voice of the voiceless because the sex purchase law was meant for them to protect the big majority who every day are being hurt, used and abused. And that is important for you to understand. And the third uh, perspective is the perspective, perspective of the man. And it has been said so many times, the, the importance of, of reducing the man. But in my work, I really see this. I see how the ordinary sex buyer is actually paying uh, the, the monthly salaries to the traffickers because he is investing his money into organized crime. And that is really important to see, see the connection between the sex buyer and the organized crime. The traffickers are into this out of one reason, and that is money. That's the only thing they care about. That's why it's so important to reduce the money. So I really want to show you a little bit on how we work with the law. You know, when I go abroad on conferences like this, there, there is uh, one uh, rumor that is circulating a lot, and it, it's that, uh, yeah, well, they managed to reduce uh, pros street prostitution in Sweden by 50%, but uh, it all just went uh, underground. So now authorities are not finding it anymore. I want to show you that this is just a myth. Uh, finding the underground prostitution is not a problem for the Swedish police at all. This is a, home, home, uh, a web page on the internet. I'm sure you have similar pages uh, in your home countries where, where young girls and also men to some extent are being advertised. Uh, 
the sex buyers will go into these sites and they will pick their advertisement, uh, an advertisement who fits their sexual preferences. Next one. Uh, and you will get some information about the girl, as you can see here, what kind of services she's up to, what the price is. And there's also a phone number uh, who you can contact if you're interested in buying sex. And if a sex buyer can sit in front of his computer and with his phone being able to locate where there is prostitution, then of course the police can do the same. Yeah, we are not stupid. It's very easy. It's just to make a simple phone call and to know where, where, where there is prostitution. So what we do after we have been located, uh, lo locating where there is prostitution, we will do physical surveillance. And that's what you see here in this picture. Uh, here's an apartment where we know that there is prostitution. You can see my two colleagues, Anders and Sanna. A man has been walking inside this apartment, and every man walking inside this apartment is suspected for being a sex buyer. So we will stand outside uh, listening uh, if we can hear anything. For example, conversations about the uh, price or, or even sexual sounds is very important for us because we use that as, as evidence against the buyer for the law. Uh, the man will be arrested uh, when he is uh, leaving uh, the, the apartment. We will confiscate his cell phone and we will go through it. Uh, you can find vital evidence, for example, text message conversation. Uh, yeah, a few months ago we arrested the chief prosecutor for the buyer of sexual services. We went through his phone and we found a lot of good evidence there we, where he had been asking the woman a, a lot of questions about what kind of things he could have. Uh, we will make the interrogation on the spot. If he is a, a, a Swedish citizen, if he is from another country, we will take him to the police station. Uh, if he admits to the crime and is a first time offender, he will receive a fine. If he denies the crime, uh, he will face a possible trial if, if the prosecutor takes it up to court. And then I or my colleagues will go up and testify against him. Uh, it's important for you to understand that the majority of the men that we arrest for the buying of sexual services uh, chooses to admit to the crime. Because in Sweden, uh, trials are public. And this is something very, very shameful. So most of the men are saying, yes, I did it. Yes. We take DNA samples on all the men that we arrest for buying sex and we match the sex buyer's DNA against our records of unsolved crimes. For example, we have this record where we only have DNA but we don't have a perpetrator. And what we have been seeing is that we have cases where we, we have taken DNA from a sex buyer and we have gotten a match against unsolved rapes. And that is very interesting. Uh, we work very close with the social services. Uh, the social services in, in Stockholm has not only social workers specialized in, in uh, handling the, the people in prostitution, they also have social workers specialized in man buying sex. And this is simply because we have seen a need that many of these men are not really feeling good about what they do. We used to speak about the myth of the happy hooker. I also want to say that there is a great myth about the happy sex buyer. Many of these men are not feeling very good about what they do. So therefore, all men that we arrest, we get, a, we get, an, offer, we get, get an offer to actually uh, go into a program and, and stop what they are doing. Because many of them have simply lost control. Uh, of course, we also work very close with the, with the social workers who are specialized in the women. Uh, selling sex. Always when we meet a new uh, woman in prostitution, which we haven't met before, we will sit down with her, the first thing we do, and we will explain to her the Swedish legislation. Because we have seen that the traffickers and pimps ha have, uh, have been tell telling the girls that if the Swedish police comes, don't say anything, because they will put you 10 years in jail. Okay. So what we do, the first thing when we make an, an arrest of a sex buyer is that we will go into the woman and we will present us as from the Swedish police and we will sit down with them and we will explain to them that we are not here to take you to prison, we are not here to do bad things or hurt you in any way and we will explain equality uh, and everything that, that I went through before. Uh, and also we will give every woman that we meet 
a straight offer that if you want to, you can pack your bags and follow us. Uh, we can take you away from here to shelter right now. Uh, and we will always give our contact information to the prostitution unit, our personal contact information that if they have any questions, if they change their minds about anything, they are free to contact us. The social perspective in our work is extremely important and we try to have social workers with, with us in the police car that ride with us when we do our job.